U.S. Representative for the 6th District here in the great state of Washington, Representative Derek Kilmer. Good morning, Derek. Hey, good morning. Good, good to be back with you. How are you doing today? Yeah, I'm doing okay. I keep getting asked that like I've been diagnosed with a terminal illness. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I'm doing fine. How about yourself? I'm well. I'm well. Uh, let's talk about, we got a range of things to talk about. First off, I was on the Twitter yesterday, and yeah. I noticed that you tweeted uh, something about uh, the president saving his golf, uh, saving golf courses from rising seas, but not Washington towns. Tell me about that. Well, you know, before, uh, before Donald Trump became president, uh, he actually applied for a permit um, to protect, to build a seawall to protect one of his golf courses. And uh, and he said the cause was rising sea levels and more severe storms uh, as a consequence of climate change. Uh, unfortunately, we've seen a bit of a change of tune um, since he's become president. Uh, in the draft budget uh, that came out, uh, they proposed zeroing out all of the coastal assistance programs for communities like Ocean Shores and Westport and Nia Bay and for tribal villages that are seeing rising sea levels and more severe storms. And I'm really concerned about it because this, you know, this is literally, this affects people's homes. I mean, we've had to work with a lot of these communities that have seen storms that, that have threatened, you know, entire complexes, entire villages with some of the Native American tribes, entire, you know, out in ocean shores. There was a, um, a seaside development that, that literally was almost wiped out mm -hmm. until we were able to get the Army Corps to come in and, and, and help out. They I'm, you know, this isn't hyperbole. They literally propose zeroing out the program altogether. And I just don't think that's right. I mean, these are communities that don't have, you know, the billions of dollars that the president has. You know, they look to the federal government for a partner. And I'm concerned that the administration is going to, in essence, say, sorry, go someplace else. Because folks don't have someplace else to go. So uh, you mentioned the Army Corps of Engineers. If there was a zero budget into this, what would not be available then? Well, you know, what, what we've seen zeroed out is a program uh, under uh, what's called the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Uh, it's a program called Coastal Zone Management Grants. And these are grants to communities, and our states used them for, for um, actually addressing impacts of, of climate change along the coast, addressing uh, uh, rising sea levels, addressing more severe storms. You know, we know that, you know, whether it be seawall investment or even in some instances relocation of properties, um, these things cost money. And, you know, the, at least the draft uh, budget from the administration proposes to zero out that assistance altogether. Been about 50 days since he, he's been the president there. What would you say his, uh, if you give him a kind of a grade here on the way that you guys have been able to interact with him and to communicate your concerns, especially about things like this? Well, you know, my biggest concern is, you know, I, and I think we, we've talked about this before. I came here because I want to see people get put back to work. And, uh, you know, my, you know, my biggest concern is making sure we have an economy that works better for everybody. And unfortunately, we, we really haven't seen any action out of the administration on that front yet. And I think that's a missed opportunity. Um, you know, and the communities I represent can't wait. They can't wait for that. And, you know, unfortunately, what we've seen instead is a lot of focus on, you know, some very divisive executive orders, you know, around immigration and refugees and, um, you know, and uh, specific issues around rights uh, that, um, you know, I think are, are more, one, more divisive and make it a lot harder to make progress in a bipartisan way. Um, but secondly, you know, I think we've got to focus on, on the economy and getting this economy moving forward. And at least so far, we haven't seen really any, any progress on that front. I'm seeing that there's a pretty aggressive timeline to try to get this new uh, American Health Care Act, the, the newest uh, iteration of this, through by the April recess. Uh, talk to me about your feelings of this bill and, and what could do to, to the folks here in the 6th District. Well, I, you know, my I have concerns both on on what's in the bill, and I also have concerns on on process. You know, my specific concerns uh, about the bill are, from every sort of third party analysis that we've seen, it's going to increase costs to taxpayers. It's going to increase costs, uh, health insurance premiums. It's going to actually cover fewer people. And you know, I, I I'm not quite sure. You know, if if you were laying out the problems you want to solve in healthcare. Um, that seems to go the wrong direction on every front. Um, 
you know, listen, I, I wasn't in Congress when the Affordable Care Act passed. I don't think it's a perfect law, and I've actually proposed some fixes that I think need to be made to help small businesses afford insurance, um, to, in, to specifically um, to, to, uh, to, to throw a lifeline to um, rural health care providers, you know, to make sure that there's more primary care providers. That's not what this bill does. Uh, you know, what this bill proposes is um, backing away from some of the improvements by reducing coverage and increasing costs. You know, it's, it, the, the bill is literally, I mean, it's an assault on Medicaid, which is the nation's health safety net that covers low-income kids and parents and Americans with disabilities and elderly people and nursing home residents. You know, this, this bill proposes really dismantling traditional Medicaid and cutting off health care for low-income workers and returning that cost, either leaving them uncovered or putting the burden on states and local governments to, 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 to provide that coverage. You know, the, the bill really targets women's health services. You know, uh, millions of women rely on Planned Parenthood for health services and cancer screenings, and, and um, this bill zeroes out uh, any assistance in that regard. Um, you know, we, we heard from folks who provide home care, uh, this bill actually negatively impacts home care providers, you know. And I, I, I you know, I, so those are my concerns in terms of content. You know, the process concerns are this bill never had a hearing. Um, this bill still hasn't, uh, you know, had an official assessment by the Congressional Budget Office to say how much it's going to cost taxpayers and what the impact is going to be on coverage. And you know, you can go back and look six years ago uh, or back in twenty. 10, when the conversations around the Affordable Care Act were happening, and the very same people who were making criticisms around process and wanting to make sure that there was adequate opportunity for the American people to weigh in on this are now saying, well, let's rush through a bill that affects a fifth of the U.S. economy and affects millions and millions of people. And again, for me, like the process concerns are almost, you know, are less relevant than the human impact, right? Like, I meet with people every day who say, listen, I only have insurance. Like, I met with a woman in Tacoma a few weeks back who said, I, I, she said, I have, I have cancer. The only reason I have insurance is because of the expansion of Medicaid. And she was a working person. She said, I don't have insurance through my employer. The only reason I have insurance is through the Medicaid expansion. Um, and this, for me, is life or death. You know, and the support that she gets is dismantled under this bill. And I think it's just it's incredibly important that we focus on, you know, it's too easy sometimes to focus on kind of ethereal po public policy. This affects human beings, yeah. and I think it's really important. And, you know, and I guess I'll, and I'll just say one, one final thing, which is, you know, this gets back at the, the, at the issue you, you asked about previously in terms of looking at the approach of this Congress and this administration. I'm unclear why, you know, a full repeal of the Affordable Care Act is the starting point of this Congress. Like, why not support, why not focus on some things that might actually have some bipartisan support, like an infrastructure package that could put people to work, you know, and fix some of our broken bridges and roads? How about a tax reform package that provides some assistance to the middle class and to small businesses? You know, why not focus there rather than on something very divisive and that you know, at least in terms of these initial proposals, going to negatively impact people. I know you've been in through a lot of uh, town halls in front of people, and you just wrapped up a telephone town hall. Has the some of the same sentiments that you're uh, talking about now, is that what you're hearing from your constituents? Overwhelmingly, yeah. I mean, we, we <laughs> I, I, I did a series of town halls. Um, we had an extraordinary turnout. I mean, just, we had a thousand people in Bremerton. We had 800 people in Squim, which I believe is like 10% of the population. I think so. <laughs> um, you know, we had uh, 440 people in Tacoma. Um, we had, you know, a, a couple hundred, two, three hundred in, in Hoquiam. You know, we just had an inc incredible turnout. And I think it's because people are concerned. Um, you know, we definitely heard from folks who are concerned about efforts uh, to dismantle the Affordable Care Act, I think the vast majority of people have the perspective I do, which is let's fix the parts that need fixing. But, you know, the notion that you just kind of throw throw out the baby with the bathwater just doesn't make sense. And the consequence is it's going to cost people more and cover fewer people. You know, I would say the other thing that came out really overwhelmingly um, within our town halls was just concern around uh, the new administration and wanting to ensure that there aren't conflicts of interest. We got a lot of questions about kind of Russian involvement mm -hmm. in 
uh, in the last election and in the government. And, you know, in my, my personal approach is no matter who's in office, I want to see accountability and ethics. And, and so I've sponsored a bill that's called the Presidential Accountability Act that says that the president and the vice president need to comply with the same ethics rules that everybody else in the executive branch have, have to comply with. And listen, I, without regard to who's the president, I believe that, that the president should have to abide by ethics, by ethics rules. Um, uh, there's another bill that I've uh, sponsored that calls for a bipartisan independent commission to look at Russian involvement. Um, and again, to me, that shouldn't be a Democratic or Republican issue. That's about the integrity of the American democracy and making sure that we're wording against foreign involvement in our democratic system. And again, I think that's something that Democrats and Republicans should all be able to get around. Finally, let's talk about this uh, introduction that you have uh, for a bipartisan cyber bill. You're going to have it in both the House and the Senate, and it's, it looks like both parties are kind of behind this. What? Tell me about this one. Yeah, I, I think we've got a good shot at seeing this bill move forward. Um, you know, and, and it's because we're seeing more and more people impacted by cyber attacks. You know, we saw, I think, 22 or 24 million Americans impacted by a hack on the Office of Personnel Management. Um, uh, we saw a, uh, you know, people are seeing their personal financial information stolen. I, I, I'm on my third credit card in two years. Wow. Um, because, you know, retailers that I've shopped at have gotten hacked. And that's, you know, I, at my town hall meetings when this came up, I said, how many of you have had to get a new credit card because of a hack? And, like, nearly every hand in the room went up. So this is affecting a lot of people. Um, you know, and technology is an amazing thing. It lets me, you know, do FaceTime on the iPad with my kiddos when I'm in Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. and it lets me shop online and all that. But unfortunately, you've got hackers and criminals out there who have, have you know, figured out that more and more information is available online, and they try to steal our stuff. And so um, this is an area where the federal government can be a better partner. So the bill that we've introduced is one that thankfully is supported by Democrats and Republicans. It would establish a cybersecurity grant program within the Department of Homeland Security specifically to help states actually um, build cyber resiliency plans, uh, outline the key issues and, uh, that they're facing in terms of cyber, and target how to fix them, and then implement those plans. Um, it also uh, focuses on the cybersecurity workforce. One of the concerns that's been raised, as we've done roundtables actually throughout the district with, with um, folks in the IT industry, you know, there's just not enough people who are going into to, to this profession to keep your personal data safe, to keep our institutions safe, and our infrastructure safe. So it, it, it dedicates some um, attention to that uh, and trying to kind of build that pipeline of cyber professionals. So. Uh, I think, you know, I'm excited that, that this is a bill that's seen um, bipartisan support, and I'm hopeful that we can get it cooking through the legislative process. U.S. Representative here in the 6th District in the great state of Washington, Derek Kilmer, always a pleasure talking with you, and thank you for doing the people's work. Awesome. Great to be with you. Thanks again. Have a good one.